Hi, I'm Bishop Greg Davis, and welcome to Young Preacher. It's been anticipated. It is the conversation of the ages. You know, almost 10 years ago, I stood at the Second Ebenezer uh, Baptist Church here in Detroit, along with Bishop Liston Page, Bishop Ergavan, Bishop James Dixon, and we did something called the Voices of the Black Church. The premier voices of the church showed up in Detroit and talked for over two hours about what was going on at that time in their generation. And almost 10 years ago, I stand now in a room full of those that have necks. I am honored tonight. It started with a tweet, young preacher years ago. And tonight, I want to thank God because I'm a man of honor. I want to thank God for Mr. Kevin Adele, the owner of the Word Network. I honor him tonight. Thank you, Kevin, for being cutting edge. Thank you for allowing us to go to the world tonight. And there are many, many of the fathers that are going to sleep. There are many of the fathers that are transitioning their churches, that are retiring. In this room tonight, I have some of the greatest young minds that you could ever talk to. I'm not here to lecture to them. Most people say, well, Bishop, I know you're going to tell them. I'm not going to tell them nothing. I am providing, through the Word Network, a platform. I'm a doorman. I open doors and help people get to the levels that they're going. And I, I want you to do me a favor before I, I pan the room. Those of you that are watching by Facebook, I want this to go by. I want you to take that share button, and I just want you to just push it all night long. Because tonight, I have some of the greatest minds. Some of them were teenagers 10 years ago. Some of them were in their 20s. Some of them were in their 30s. Some of them might have not even been, you yeah, know, they were born. But they're in the room tonight. There have been people that have wrote me about wanting to be in the room. But I have over 40 of God's best tonight. And I am humbled to be the old preacher in the room tonight with this generation. Some of them have next. Some of them have now. We're going to find out what all that means. In a time where people want to go to church less and less. The church is in the palm, literally, of our hands on our cell phone. And tonight, I want to welcome you on behalf of the Word Network to Young Preacher. Young Preachers, give God praise in this house. Look at it. Look at it. Look at it. Look at it. I'm going to take questions. I'm going to be popping back and forward on Facebook. They're going to give me questions. Facebook Live. We're going to talk tonight. And I'm going to introduce my first panel tonight because I want to get right to it. Our first panel tonight consists of uh, Adrian Davis. Give God, come on. David Winston. <laughs> Pastor YPJ. Dr. Irisha Hilliard. Pastor Joel Tudman. And Nathan Culver. Before I start, there's two young men. Uh, I, I, I shared with them the vision that I had in this has been sitting in the incubator for like two years. And I finally went to Mr. Sheffield and said to him, I said, hey, I want to do a young preacher show. And I was talking to Jathan Austin right here. Jathan, raise your hand with the, with the, with the, with the jacket on. I told you I was going to get you. Uh, I shared my vision with him. And he said, hold on. Let me get YPJ. And then we begin to talk. And these young men have worked so hard with me to bring this vision to pass. I love both of you. I know I got on your nerves. That's why I'm the old preacher. <laughs> Tonight, I stand here on the shoulders of my grandfather. My cousin reminded me today that my grandfather went home to be with the Lord at 92 years old, still pastoring uh, longer than he probably should have, but he was of another generation. Died in Bible class in a circle on the floor praying. Went home to be with the Lord immediately. And then, ever since I was nine years old, I served in the church. I'm 56 now, and I've served. I've honored. Then, I met a man by the name of Bishop Paul Sylvester Morton. Hey, Bishop. I met a man by the name of Bishop Paul Sylvester Morton. And I don't know anything but honoring and serving, and here's another word, loyalty. Even when, even when Pierce, um, I wasn't pastoring for a season, I joined a church called Triumph Church. I asked my spiritual father, could I have a local pastor? Because that's all I've ever known. And so I honor Pastor Solomon Kenlock. He's still my pastor, even though I'm pastoring again. So I said all that to say this. 
Is honoring and serving and being loyal a thing of the past? With, we're going right to it. We can't talk, right? Is it a thing of the past? Because I still honor. My grandfather, I mean, my, my um, bishop was here last week preaching for my pastor. And I was like a little kid. Anything I can do, I was like a little kid in the candy store. I was trying to serve both of them. So is that something that is taboo? Are we still honoring and serving Tubman? Bishop, I don't think that it's a thing of the past, but I do think that it has to be taught. It has to be brought up on a regular basis. Um, of course, the old church, it was, you saw it. But in today's time, you really don't because most of the people that are running the ministries are pretty young. So they looked at each other like brothers and sisters versus pastor. So I don't think that it's a lost art, but I do think that it needs to be taught a little bit more. Anybody want to add, Culver? Yeah, I think that uh, when we live in a time when there are a lot of broken homes, there's a missing piece of teaching honor. And honor, I think, is begins, uh, it has to be taught at home for it to spill into other areas of a person's life. So because the church has become the supplement for broken homes, we find that honor is a missing link and, and the peace is not connected oftentimes. How, how do you, um, and you all can, it's a conversation, you all can raise your hand at any time, and I'm, let me get this mic right here, because I'm being filled down to you tonight, that was my hero. Y'all, some of y'all don't even know who that is, uh, Olanda, you don't even know who that is, good. Um, what, what, did, what, what is honor, Pastor Wendt, what, what is honor and serving and, and all that, what, what is that? Well, I think honor um, is when you are placing a high value on them. And that you're not placing a high value on them because it's convenient for you. But you're placing a high value on them and then you're treating them according to that value, whether it's convenient or not. And so you are always putting them at the forefront or you are making sure that you are staying in line with kind of what they have set, the presence that they've set, the ministry that they set, the standard that they've set, and you want to make sure that you continue to, um, to reverence them. And I think as you keep that value, that you'll really find yourself honoring them. Anybody want to add to that part? Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I don't think that necessarily honor is a missing piece, but um, as Bishop Tubman said, I do think it needs to be talked about. I do think that it needs to be taught. How I view honor is going beyond what you feel like. And I think that um, <clears throat> our culture, you know, I am a hip hop head, I guess you could say. I love cultural music. Bruno Mars has a song called It's What I Like. And so he'd be like, you know, champagne, strawberries on ice. But then he says a line in here. We'll think that that man, oh, my God, you know, lady saying, yes, I want that. But he says, lucky for you. That's that's what I like. And I think the misconception is I honor when I feel like it. And we miss we mislabel that. Like if somebody does what they feel like and then we call that honor. No, honor is not honor until it's a sacrifice. I don't feel like it, but I'm still going to do it. That's what honor is. And I think that we, our culture, our, our generation, we honor when it's comfortable, when it's convenient. And we're saying, I honor you, but lucky for you, that's what I like to do right now. But if I get in my feelings, it's do out we, the window. Do we still honor even when we're rebuked? I mean, I, 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 I left, I remember <laughs> leaving in Morgan, uh, in Louisiana, my bishop rebuked me right in front of the bishop's council. Uh, I'm talking about Bishop Eddie Lone and Neil Ellis and all them, and I literally went to start a church crying in my car. And when I got there, I wiped my eyes, and I was still there. See, I believe that true honor is after you get rebuked, you still show up. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But is that still the rule in this generation? Mm -hmm. Somebody help me out. Is that still YPJ? Well, God loves honor, and honor is connected to promotion. And there are times when when you're honoring someone, they will rebuke you. And even it will seem like rejection. The Bible says that when David was anointed king in front of his father, his daddy didn't bow down to him. He sent him back to the sheep. But then he called him one day and he said, go and take this food to your brothers, which meant even though he was anointed, he was still submitted to his father and he served his brothers. 
then he ends up promoted. When you accept that even though you're anointed, you must submit to authority and serve others, God still honors that and he promotes you because of it. But people have a hard time with that because it doesn't always feel good to humble yourself when you know you've got oil on your life. But ultimately, I believe it benefits us in the end. Let, let me, let me uh, Bishop Alvernus Johnson, who's a dear friend of mine, some of you all may know him, he did a Facebook Live and he said, the sons are arrogant and the fathers are angry. The sons are arrogant because they step out ahead of time and they start their own and they leave before they get their inheritance. Um, and the fathers are angry because y'all step out ahead of time and don't wait for, well, let me submit to you this. Uh, had I waited on my grandfather, he, he was 93 years old when he died. At 92, I would have been 46. Y'all probably wouldn't know me. So what do you do with that, Pastor Sharp? Um, thank you for the question. <laughs> You're most I, welcome. I think all of our calls come from God and that there's a responsibility to make sure that when you have a father or mother in ministry, that if God is leading you in a different direction, that, that, that you owe that mother and that father honesty, if nothing else. You owe them the honesty to tell them what God is showing you, what you're feeling. And then from there, you make wise moves. David behaved himself wisely in the presence of King Saul. So God, your call comes from God, but you owe, you literally owe your mother and father who's poured into you respect enough to share what God is showing you. And congratulations to you. Thank you. The successor of fellowship in one year just announced breaking news all over the world. Yes, hey, Pastor Thank Charles you. Jenkins, bless you. Thank you, man of God. So, so what if they say you're not ready? Because pe now, now this conversation is in this house, but there are millions watching. And what we say right now, some young preacher that's younger than you is going to take this as, so what do you do when they say, when they say you ain't ready? Uh, great question. Great question. I believe that sometimes uh, we don't put enough value. Say who you are. I'm sorry. Okay, I didn't I'm say. sorry. Uh, Pastor Leon Andre Bumper, Saving Station, Tupelo, Mississippi. I think I didn't we don't. Y'all the church and all you put everything in. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> Plug. Uh, I don't think we put enough value on our father's voices. Uh, so when they speak, they're not just sometimes speaking from trying to hold us back, but they're trying to protect us as well. And I think that the, 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 the problem that our generation do have, because I kind of think a little different on this topic, uh, our generation don't want to listen at times. So it, it puts a stigma on all of our generation when it's not really all of us that's doing that, if I could say that. Okay. Let, 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 me, let, me, let me, there's evangelists in here, and of course I've been an evangelist, and um, what do you do if you are a son? And, you know, I remember one of I'm telling that story years ago. She wanted to go on vacation, and she asked her pastor, and our pastor said, um, he didn't say nothing for weeks. And she said, Pastor, I, he still didn't say nothing. And so what do you do when your pastor says, time to stay home for a while, listen to the word? What do you do? Evangelist. <laughs> Gary Spreewell, Los Angeles, you stay home and listen. Um, I think it has to start with a genuine God relationship. I think, unfortunately, a lot of uh, young preachers are, are under an, a leader that they're not submitted to because they don't feel the genuine connection as a father. And um, if that's the individual that God has you submitted to, then you submit your itinerary, you submit your budget, you submit your life to the, to the direction of that leader because that may be the week a bomb is on your airplane. So you never know what God is leading your leader uh, to have you do for, for whatever reason. So you submit to it, you, you close your calendar. Somebody said to me uh, today by, by text, and I said, I said, this was good. I'm going I'm to I'm put this in here. It has been said that the young preacher wants what comes after the struggle, but don't want to go through the struggle that we've been through. You want the blessings that comes after the struggle, but don't want to go through the struggle. 
True or false? Anybody want to hit that? Bishop, nobody wants to go through the struggle. <laughs> nobody wants to struggle. Nobody wants to go through that. But, but, um, but you know what I mean. I, I do, but we have to answer it that way. Nobody wants to go through uh, losing, uh, you starting the church with your own money, uh, you paying the bills. I did that. It doesn't feel good. I know what that's like. But if I had an opportunity to do it a different Same. way, Same. I would do it a different way. I'd go back in time and allow uh, God to bless me that way. But I went through the struggle. But nobody wants Tugman. to go through the struggle. Tugman. The Bible says a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. 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 So right. people who are discrediting us because we didn't struggle, I think it's an insecurity. My father didn't want me to be so broke. You all don't, you all, but you all don't believe that there's no struggle in this? But it let it be my own. I don't want to have to go through no, what you not, went through. No, we're not saying, we're not saying, because I happen to kind of agree with it, we're not saying that you have to go through the same thing, but there is something you have to go through. And, 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 and this generation feel like, you know, that you don't go through nothing. Just because Just we don't pimp share the heaven. same struggle <laughs> doesn't mean we don't have struggles. And as my father, you, you should it. pave the way for me so that I don't have to have that same struggle. If I'm watching you and you're being an example, I should see you and learn some lessons from you so that I don't have to have that lesson. I, I've already looked at you and I've watched you so I don't have to have that same experience because I watched you go through that. So I don't have to do that. But there's something that's going to come up in my life that I will relate to it and say, oh, this is how my father handled it. So this is how I'm going to do it. So just because our struggles are not identical. No, I don't want to have to give my whole life savings for the church. I want to be a financially strong church, but I may have a different struggle, which is being a multi-generational church. That doesn't mean I'm not a great pastor. I've just got a different struggle. Anybody else want to add to that? All right. Pass that back. Pass it right quick. Say your name right quick, Pastor. Pastor Andre Mitchell from Muncie, Indiana. If you are really called, the attack on your life will present its own struggle. So people who are trying to get around the struggle, if you are called, the threat on your life from the enemy will draw in attack. There's no way of getting around it. So a young preacher who is really called, he will have to walk through or she will have to walk through something. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Pastor can, can I jump in? And, and, and that word struggle, I agree with a lot of these comments. I want to replace that word struggle with commitment. Because I think that's really what the older generation might see the lack of in the young generation. It's not that I need to see you struggle. Because like Dr. Irisha said, that, that's foolishness for a good father to want to see you go through pain. But really, I believe what is being seen is there is a lack of commitment, and you haven't shown that you have the fortitude necessary to push the church forward. And, and I went through my own struggle. Son, you're going to go through your struggle, but you need to show commitment. You need to show diligence. You need to show that you can push past every trial and circumstance and overcome each one. The kingdom is advance and hold, advance and hold. And so I believe that we have to show that we have commitment. We have the grit that won't quit and give in that will push forward. Anybody else on that? Yeah. Yes, sir. Brandon Jacobs. Uh, Hammond, Indiana. I think that a part of that is also a lot of them haven't taught us how to struggle. You know, a lot of a lot of our predecessors, we've seen them in the big cars, we've seen them with the alligator shoes, we've seen them in the limelight, and so a lot of what we looked forward to, we looked at that and said that is success. And so I think a lot of it is you you have to show us what struggle looks like before you get angry with us because we don't seem to be struggling like you because I really think that it's not just the struggle uh, that they're against. I think they're against the fact that our generation may be a little flashy. We, we show a lot. We, we, we want to show our Gucci shoes and our Gucci ties and we want to show our, our new cars and so on and so forth. So I think a lot of it is just that they, they haven't taught us how to struggle and I believe that the reason the suicide rate is so high is because when we look at what success may be 
And when those of us who had to do what Tupman did, as I did, start from scratch, you had nothing. You struggled through. And you're looking so, at another who's as successful. You, you, you gauge yourself. You're comparing yourself. And you're wondering, why am I not there? And then you are discouraged because you were not taught so how to are go you, through are this you saying that we, didn't, we just showed you the cars and, and the gators and all that? I ain't worn nothing in a long time, but is that what you're saying? What I'm saying is... You, I you, traded mine for some Nikes. <laughs> But oh, what you, is that I, what you're saying? I, Bishop, a lot of those pastors didn't let us into that. You know, we served, but we served seeing success. So, so they didn't bring us into what it looked like to struggle. They were not transparent enough to tell us this is what it looks like. This is what what's going through looks like. You know, we saw perfect marriages, and then we have our marriage. Oh, we gonna get to that. Through. You know, so when we look at these perfect things, and then we get there, you know, we we start to think maybe something is wrong with us because they didn't teach us what struggle was. Okay. Sharp, you good. Yes, sir. Uh, Christopher Foster, uh, Northern California. I think that the issue is that we've invited competition in, a, in an arena where we should be not competing against one another, but complimenting one another. If Saul would have said to David, I'm insecure because I don't want to hand you the baton because it's going to take away some of my shine. And if David would have said to Saul, I'm insecure because I was rejected by my father. Then maybe they could synchronize their steps and pass the baton. The problem is the predecessor holds on to it a little too long, and the successor is reaching for it prematurely. But if we could recognize we're on the same team, and if we have the perfect synchronized transition, the team wins multiple generations because God is not an individual God he's a multiple generation God Abraham Isaac Jacob so I feel like if we will be transparent the team can win but if we have that Shaq Kobe mentality we missing out on a lot of championships we could have won for the kingdom I, I was watching um Bishop uh Jakes I needed to be fed uh and I was watching Bishop Jakes at Cheryl Brady's church in Bishop Brady's church the other week and he said I'm tired I want to hand it over I feel the same way. I've been doing this since I was nine years old. Um, I want to get old, but when I look at it, I don't know if, if y'all prepared. So now if you say you submit and you honor and, and, and the fathers are saying don't know if you're prepared, then what do you do with that? I have a question for you. I know, I can't. If, if the fathers are looking at us and wondering, are we prepared? I think the uh, the glaring anomaly yes. or the problem You were there, is, weren't you? Yes, I was yeah. there. Yeah. Okay. So if the fathers are looking at, at us and they're wondering if we're prepared, then I think the elephant in the room is they must have not prepared us. Because if they would have prepared us, there would be no question that we were prepared. And, you know, I think about whether it's Elijah and Elisha, whether it's Paul and Timothy, whether it's Jesus and the disciples, sonship comes with a process. It comes with a program. It comes with some type of uh, uh, training. And I, I see a lot of pastors that just say, hey, you're not ready. Sit there, wait until it's your time. Well, between the call and the commission, there should be cultivation. So I should be getting trained. I should be getting developed. I should be getting uh, rearing, studying, whatever the case may be. So I think that's what we're looking for. And that'll bring that level of trust and submission when we know that we're being trained for our assignment. If you just tuned in, you're watching um, Conversation conversation of the Ages, or, or a Young Preacher. Uh, those of you that are watching by Facebook, we want you to share this conversation right now. I'm seeing your comments. I, I see you, Odetta. I see you, Stacy. I see you, Nicole. All of you that are, uh, give me your questions. The other thing is, uh, we have some fathers and generals in the faith that have, uh, most of them don't know, that are uh, doing roll-ins for us. And so we're going to take you to the first one. He's 93 years old. He is uh, the new presiding bishop uh, of an organization, Bishop Rudy, Rudolph McKissick Sr. Uh, Ray, let's roll it in right quick. Greetings, young preacher. Young preacher, what a delight for me to just be saying a word or so to you about pastoring. I have pastored for 48 years, retired now, 91 years old, 91 years older, and still usable. But if I had to say anything about pastoring and if someone were to ask me, 
what was the key to my success in pastoring, and you'd have to measure that success by God. I would say to them, I struggled to love the people because what I discovered, the more we love God, the more God will bless us to love the people. The more we love the people, the more God will allow us to use his love for them despite people. We get a great lesson from Jesus when he teaches us about the great commandments and how the great commandments indeed will help us to love everybody as we love ourselves. So love the people. Love them in season and out of season. And I know you can preach to them that way, but love them in season and out of season. And God will keep you seasoned as a pastor to endure and certainly to succeed. Bless you, young preacher. Give it up for Bishop Rudy Rudolph McKissick Sr. Thank you, sir. That just kind of just does something to you, don't it? Ooh, I thought that was Ananias Davis. He used to tell me, son, just love the people. And they would tell him off and cuss him out in the business meeting, son, just, and he'd walk away. I'm like, how you do that? Welcome back to Young Preacher. Uh, Dr. Arisha, you, you, I cut you off, but I just wanted to get that in. No problem. I think, you know, after that last comment, we have to stop playing the blame game. You won't pass it to me. I'm ready. And listen. If you go back to the opening comment, it's honor, respect. So when they say you're not ready, why am I not ready? And really listen. I remember in 2015, my father made a statement to me. He said, if I give the church to you right now, it probably would go to nothing. It was a hard statement to hear, but I listened. And if I was honest with myself, there was an area that I had not grown in personally. Could I preach? Yes. Could I raise an offering? Yes. But loving the people, I needed to grow in. Oh, that was perfect. And so when I got that part right, and I shifted personally in some areas in my life that most people didn't know, that's when I was ready to take the mantle. So instead of playing the blame game, we got to stop and say, okay, what is it that you see in my life that I don't see? Because if we're talking about legacy, it's about how you see me and how I see you. And I always have to see you as a voice that can correct me, even when I don't want to be corrected. Very good. Let me, let me do this. I, I, have a, I have a couple questions to ask y'all. What has been the greatest disappointment from our generation to you all. What disappoints you all about us? Now, I'm kind of in the middle. I'm like in the 50s and then the next generation, you know, they, they're in their 60s, so I'm kind of in, in the middle. What, what's the greatest disappointment in us? Nissan Stewart from Los Angeles, California. My disappointment is that some of our forefathers or fathers don't listen. Uh, they don't, you know, they have the word, but certain things that this generation speaks, they don't listen to, and they detach themselves. And so as we're trying to help them evolve in ministry, they just don't listen to us because we're too young. That's, that's what I see. Is that a, they don't listen, or maybe you're not with the right person that fits what you're, I was talking to a young man, let me, let me show you, I was talking to a young man, and he may be watching he, uh, in, in my office. Everybody knows Starbucks is my office. Send us some money, Starbucks. <laughs> Starbucks is my office. <laughs> and um, he said to me that my pastor thinks that this is radical. And, that's, and for me, I was like, what's wrong with that? Because, you know, I'm in a, and I'm like, I just think you're not in the right place. Because when you're in the right place, they're not your friends, but it at least agrees with what you do. So could it be that? It definitely could be that. And so we have to, I think many of us are in transitional periods, seeing what we're connected to, what we might have to leave or escape from because of that. So you should pray for those that's in that situation. So when do you, when do you do that? When do you say, do you switch daddy? Because I've been with mine for 27 years almost. I, I don't know. When do you do that? Ooh, I, I, let me see which way I'm going to go. Come on. 
One minute, y'all. Come on. I think you have like to, a funeral. One I, minute. I think you have to. <laughs> I think you have to um, decipher the dis difference between your father and mentors. Um, and I think there are certain seasons to where um, you attach yourself to mentors to be able to take you to certain places. But you, you can't change your DNA. And I think the problem is we are switching um, in this season our fathers for mentors. Um, and it is causing um, a great um, upheaval in the body of Christ now because people are switching um, to mentors when I believe we should stay with our fathers, but our fathers also have to be secure enough to release us to get things we can't get from them. I, I remember, you know, Bishop Moore, I keep saying it's my father, but I remember I'd go to Bishop Hilliard's and he would always sit down when he come on my show and say, one thing about you, you gonna always bring up Bishop Moore no matter who on the thing. That's right, that's my dad. But I, I received from him, I received from Bishop Andrew Merritt and, and others, but I didn't change my father. Who, Dr. Ron Whitaker uh, from Delaware. Uh, Bishop, to your point, uh, honestly, I've experienced hating when God has uh, led me to do things a little bit differently, such as go to school. So just because your generation might have not went to school, next thing I'm hearing is, uh, you know, uh, things being said over the pulpit about school and how you need to be spending more time with God. So uh, to me, that was uh, really hurtful to me honestly in my development this stuff really be going on yes. you saying okay um let, let's let's move on we got one more okay hold on i think one of the my name is pastor canna Lee from kingdom christian center in south bend indiana and i think one of the greatest disappointment was the fact that people stopped being fathers and stopped developing relationships and the only way to get access was how much money you had so if I couldn't afford to be in your presence, then I didn't get a chance to, to get your information. But Jesus gave that information out free, and it transformed the world. So you don't believe that you should see to your father? I do believe that. Okay. I do believe that. I just that. don't want to throw that all the no, way no. out there because you, you, you I, got people I believe, listening. I do believe, I do believe that. No, I, but I'm, you're right. I understand what you're saying. I, I believe Thank that. You, I, I believe in honor. <laughs> I believe in honor and okay, I believe but, in sowing. But it goes too far to the... Yeah, yeah. When, when it's a business deal and not ministry, then, right. then you're not feeling like a son. You feel more like a John. Okay. So let me ask you this. Bishop, please yeah, don't, who's change, that? don't change the subject. Okay. Uh, We're trying to do a whole I lot. I know you are, but that's a, that's a touchy subject because you're putting it all on the sons. What about the fathers who've got unhealed wounds that can't love a son? And so then you have a son that wants to be fathered. And then you just made the statement. statement uh, and you said, well, do you change fathers? Well, what happens when the father don't want the son? Wow. Or what if, he doesn't rec what if he doesn't recognize him as the son? Well, what I don't want to be nowhere do? that don't nobody love me. So that's, yeah. So then when he changes, then he gets that statement, which internally does something to him. I, I know, but why stay somewhere even in any kind of relationship that you're not being... Huh? Okay, come on. We got eight minutes in this one. Okay. Bishop Ernest Robinson um, from Long Island, New York. I think the, the bishop over here brought up a, a very good point to it because when you look at David and you look at Saul, Saul comes, um, he meets David at a point of his own rejection. God just finished rejecting Saul. And then here comes David in the house. Saul didn't necessarily have a problem with passing on the baton. Saul had an issue of who it was going to. So sometimes who's next is not the father's choice, but, you know, it's who God chose. And so it becomes a challenge. So sometimes the fathers are having an issue because I don't want to father you into the next. I want Jonathan, but God chose David. All right, let, let, me, let me do this. Um, so what will it take? What will it take to bring both together? What, what, an uh, act of Congress? <laughs> what, what, will, what, what will it take? It's going to take mediation. Mark Moore. 
uh, Malachi talks about the fact in the last days, he says, I will send my prophet and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the sons and the sons to the fathers. And I think that we emphasize the turning part without emphasizing the fact that somebody has to lead the conversation. And so I think that, that part of what's missing from this conversation, Bishop, is the cultural element um, that we really haven't addressed in this whole jealousy and my turn and my time. I think that part of it is we have been modeled a uh, description, a picture of success that has reduced our view of ministry to the point where if I'm not the senior pastor, if I don't have a reserve spot, if I don't have an appreciation Sunday, then I don't matter in ministry. And so we create cultures and contexts where you're a wonderful number two, you're a great assistant, but you can't be gifted and be an assistant, so you got to go start your own. So sometimes it's people pushing folks out. Sometimes it's people pulling folk out. Doc, if you'd start your own church, everybody would go with you. Well, that's not always true because you're going to serve. Everybody's not a number, a number one. Everybody's though. not a number one. But the problem, going back to what you asked about our issues with that generation, you all have modeled models of ministry, created models of ministry where there's only one man or one woman per house. Yes. And if you're not the senior voice, then you don't matter at all. And so I think that we have to emphasize the importance of secondary leadership, uh, the importance of, of, of building context in our churches where you don't have to be the senior pastor to matter. And I think that that's something that's going to lead to this Well, raise your hand, Pastor Dana. That's the executive pastor of my church. That's my evangelism pastor right there. So y'all, I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm going to live a long time. The greatest thing that happened to me was uh, in the 90s when I went back back in the day to Earl Polk's church and he had a hundred and something pastors. He had pastors over the parking lot over. It changed my life. I came back, oh you are elder, you are, only problem with that is I did it too fast. You know, I was younger then. But um you're right, we have to. So let me let me let me let me let me so what are y'all saying? We need to have conversations like this and then we need to have them in the room too with us. But this is a start. Yes sir. Say your name. Kevin Duarte, San Antonio, Texas. I would say this conversation is unnecessary. I'd also believe that there shouldn't be an admission fee to have it. <laughs> and then y'all be trying to decide where the money going. <laughs> Pastor Bolden. Um, my name is Pastor Bolden from Central Baptist Church here in Detroit, Michigan. Um, I, I want to say that um, we always use comparisons of David and Saul and Elijah and Elisha when we're talking about um, that relationship but I think we got to include some Christology in our leadership. We have to pay attention to how Jesus walked with the disciples day, day by day. And many times we miss those lessons because we only see the fathers on Sundays. But you got to serve throughout the week so you can come see the struggles and the part of the work that you don't see when the suit is on and when the gators are on. Also, when you look at the relationship of Jesus and his disciples, the Bible says that Jesus looked at them one day and said, I no longer call you my disciples, but now you're my friends. He says, because slaves don't know what their masters are doing, but I've revealed to you everything that is going on. And as that, re that relationship of father and son has to grow because we don't see enough parallels between natural fatherhood and spiritual fatherhood because my dad don't ask me to buy him gifts. I buy him gifts out of honor. But my father, as I grow, he pushes me out on to, to walk on my own and to do what he's taught me to do and to throw me out there. But he didn't throw me out there before he exposed me to both the glory and the work side of what it means to be in this ministry thing. How many believe more is caught than taught? So that you have to be around. Because I hear a lot of times um, younger preachers say, you know, not spending no time with me. But I, I'm from the philosophy, if you know anybody know Bishop Morton, he don't do a lot of talking. You got to kind of catch it. And so I just think in so many cases, we want, we want them to talk. Let's do this. Uh, uh, the next roll in comes from a woman that I absolutely love. I used to try to preach like her, the Reverend Bishop Jacqueline McCullough. Young preacher, greetings. My name is Bishop Jacqueline McCullough from Pomona, New York, the International Gathering at Beth Rapha. And I'm here to encourage you, if you have the call to be a pastor, to be a shepherd, just want to leave a few words with you. A shepherd is one who feeds, one who guides, and one who provides. 
The question is, what are we feeding? We're feeding the Word of God. How are you guiding? Your counsel should be from the Word and through the Holy Spirit. What are you protecting the sheep from? Heresy and false teachings. And you can't know what a false teaching is if you don't know what the truth is. So my encouragement to you is it's not just the call, it's the preparation and then the execution. I don't know who prepared you for pastoralship, but it's so essential for you to be equipped because it's one of the greatest jobs in the world. You prepare people for their eternity. So I encourage you to study the Word of God so you could feed the right food. I encourage you to understand the Word of God so that you can give counsel. And I encourage you to stand on the Word of God so you could keep people from heresy and false teachings. This is just a few nuggets for you and hopefully it will do your heart good. Give it up for Bishop Jacqueline McCullough. Thank you, Bishop. You're watching Young Preachers, Conversation of the Ages. I'm going on Facebook. I'm looking at some of your comments. I need you to share right now. I need it to be like hundreds of you sharing right now the broadcast. Guess what? The show is not going to end at 10. We're going to carry on on Facebook Live for another 30 minutes. It's the behind the scenes. Right now, coming up, give it up right now for our musical guest, a young preacher, a man formerly of men of standard. Give it up for Bishop Brian Pierce. I got joy. Come on, put your hands together. I got joy, 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 unspeakable joy. Cause I can't explain that he took all the pain and he gave me joy. Supernatural joy. I wonder, do you have it now? Yeah. He took away all and he gave me. Yes, he did. Come on, let me see you clap your hands. I've got peace, peace, peace. Perfect peace. Because I feel no harm. He ceased every storm and he gave me peace. Mind blowing peace. Yes, he did. Yeah, I got it now. I feel no harm. Cause he sees every storm. And he gave. Yes, he did. This the part I like. I got praise, praise, praise. A radical praise. Cause I can't contain that. He took away all.
Welcome back to, now we ain't going there. I don't care what you do, welcome. You can dance all day, YPJ. Welcome back. Cause then y'all be talking about we didn't have enough substance. I'm going, I'm be like the preacher, open your Bibles too. Y'all shouting all the way around. Welcome back to Young Preacher, Conversation of the Ages. I'm so glad we almost had 500 shares. I need another 500, y'all share. You're watching the Word Network. I'm Bishop Greg Davis. We change panels. Let's give it up for the last panel, you all. <laughs> Joining us now in, in, our, in our second panel uh, tonight, I'm, I'm finding it right here, uh, Kevin Duhart, uh, Kenneth, am I saying it right? Kenneth. Kenneth. Yes. Lee, Pastor YPJ, and Jathan Austin. Give it up. I, I came up in a time where um, preachers were relational. Those of you that are from Detroit, um, Reverend C.L. Franklin, when he was living, everybody ran over there to his broadcast. And we, we just, you know, even when I passed it in the 90s, folk just came to all my conferences and stuff. People are not relational like they used to be. Um, and I don't know what the disconnect that is stopping my generation, what gener where, is it, where is it at? But, these four brothers are c called themselves the what? Justice League, baby. The Justice yeah. League. Uh, I also came up in a time where <laughs> Why you like I'm that? not bright. Justice League. Yeah, that was very sexy. Man. <laughs> We're not supposed to. Yeah, be. not a rap group, man. R and B group. <laughs> where, where you know, you went to the coffee shop and you had coffee and you talked. But now, where's the trust? Can we really share our hearts? Can we share with one another that our marriage is not good? Can we share that we're really struggling and, and don't have no engagements on the calendar? Can we struggle that we're struggling with suicide? We're struggling with an alternative life. Can we share with one another without, I'm going to date myself, without telling somebody and they tell two friends and they tell two friends and so, thank you, see somebody else age themselves too, and so on and so on. So how did this start? Well, honestly, it really started in pain. I personally was the one that kind of introduced everyone to everyone, but during my divorce, uh, these three guys not only listened to me cry and ache, but they held me accountable. And so in that time frame, we developed a very loving, abusive relationship where they would tell me about myself when I didn't want to hear it. And from there it developed. And I discovered something that real covenant is built on offense. When you can offend each other, and be honest with each other, and then beyond that, there's still that stability. But Kevin, Kevin is the most brutal of us all. So, like, no, I'm just kidding. Like, what is it? Why are we so close? I think that um, I consider the relationship between Jonathan and David. About eight years ago, maybe nine years ago, no, ten years ago, I was praying for relationships. We met. We both were youth pastors preaching for a particular ministry, and. Um, did our Bottom thing, and, and, uh, and uh, when we were done ministering together, we ended up being friends. This is key. I think what knitted my heart and vice versa is the same thing that would knit Jonathan and David. Uh, when David returned with victory, actually the head of Goliath, and um, Jonathan overheard the relation or the conversation between Saul and David, his heart was knitted to David's, and he gave him his robe, he gave him his sword. He gave him his belt. And so that relationship of covenant was established, which means I see potential in you so much so that what I'm carrying, you need. And in that in exchange there, it's like he saw that David was actually called to do what he was wearing. You know what I mean? And so in our relationship, it's like I see this potential in you. I'm willing to give you and empty out of what I have 
to make sure that you are successful in what it is that God's called you to do. And that exchange has been healthy and consistent because we are intentional about making sure each other is successful. So, now, now Pastor YPJ and I, we, we go back way back. We were enemies in high school. We were enemies fighting over the same girl. I took his girl. I let him have her. Why do you keep And then voice, I decided man? I wanted her back. Why do you keep doing this voice? <laughs> and I took her back. And now we don't, neither one of us have her. That's so. right. So, She's but, watching right now. <laughs> maybe. But one of the things that I can say, my, my sister was murdered 2004. Uh, we started doing ministry and traveling, just going because we had spare time. We we're in the same city. But when my sister in my worst moment where I didn't even know if I could preach or go forward, I looked up and my best friend stayed with me for three days, didn't change his clothes, didn't leave my side, and, and, and helped me through one of the darkest moments of my life. And I didn't know that a couple of months later, his uncle would be murdered in Africa and I would have to do the same thing for him. So we, our, our relationship and friendship was built out of, out of extreme hurt where nobody else could minister to us in a way that we needed to be ministered to. Pastor Wabi, I mean, Pastor Jason. These guys mean the world to me because they met me at the worst time of my life. And I think when you have guys that you can be naked with, and I think the whoa, problem whoa, whoa, whoa. is- Bring not, some clarity to that. Not <laughs> physically naked, so let's, but when you can share your deepest, darkest secrets with, because one of the problems that our generation has is sincerity. One of the problems our generation has is being genuine. And, you know, unfortunately, and this is not shade, but the generation before us taught it. So they taught us how to dock each other, but not how to be transparent with each other. So because of that, we didn't know how. And they taught us how to cover each other's mess, but not help each other through the mess. And so I found some brothers that were genuine that we can call each other out on our stuff and uh, we're not too um we're not in a position where we feel like we're beyond that level of accountability to one another there are people that are watching and they hear you but the the truth of the matter is um there's the trust element when, when did you all get to the the place that you really did you test the trust to make sure that you know your transparency was not going to leak out because you know, we got leaky folk. What do you think, Kevin? That was, that's something I think in a rough spot for me personally, uh, it wasn't necessarily that I trusted Kenneth or Jathan or Jonathan. It was more so that I trusted God. I got to a place where I needed, I needed some assistance. I needed somebody to talk to. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to trust God with this relationship. And if it fails me, at least I tried. And I think you get to a point where you come to the end of who you are. You, you come to the end of not having anybody that can understand or relate to what it is that God has called you to do. You have to trust God with those relationships he's bringing into your life. Um, and so that, I, that's what built that trust factor in me is I trusted God with, with that, not them, but God first. I, I think for me it wasn't even about, and I, I thank God for my brother because he's deep and he trusted God. I didn't <laughs> really trust God, you know. Um, because sometimes you can trust God and still miss the person. But um, for me, it was I really needed to be around genuine guys that you could really expose yourself in a way that, that wouldn't embarrass you, that they would help you through that type of thinking. And I think for us, it made such sense to me when I met these guys, because I first met um, Jay, and then when I met Jay, he introduced me to Kevin, and what I had to learn is we all had to build our own relationships. So all of our relationships are different. We need each other, but they're all different. And we trust each other in different ways. Is there, is there, is there accountability? Oh, oh, definitely. Also, it's the fact that we have the ability to um, be honest with each other. And that's the accountability that many people don't have. And the fact that we're confident men yeah, man. who are not insecure. Um, Jonathan and I, we, we, YPJ and I, we pastor in the same city. But all of these years that we traveled the road, I knew that God had a great call on his life. I'm glad being a local pastor, doing my thing, serving my community. But Jonathan has a call to the nation. And so one thing that though he has that great call to the nation, the most important thing he needed 
was a friend that's going to have his back no matter what. And so I have, I, I made it my point to push his ministry, to push Pastor Duhart's ministry, to push Jathan's ministry, and not be insecure because things may be better for them than they are for me. But I know what I do, and I, and I do what I do, and they do what they do. How, how many of you all have, have this kind of relationship? Je everybody? Raise your hand. Keep your hands up. Okay. I don't see Pastor Calvin. I don't see Pastor Mitchell. Pastor Calvin. You look at me like Bishop. Well, one of the things I learned, Bishop, is uh, when I try to rely on friends or to use people, I needed to get to a place where I can have more relationship with God and to have my relationship to grow in God to, to try to lean on people because I got to a point in life where I started depending on people more than I did God. See, I, I'm, I'm a pastor, you know, okay, I, I'm an introvert. Most people don't know that. I sit at Starbucks every day. I don't, I don't, I don't have this. I'm just be honest. I don't have this. I'm, a, I'm being transparent. I'm an introvert, and uh, I'm more comfortable right now. Where many others would be nervous with this. This is my family. This is, this is. You know, I have my church people, but you know, I have certain ones. But I don't have friends like this. So I honor you all and I celebrate you all. Mine comes from trust. Mine comes from the lack of trust that most time when I try to have a relationship, people are shoving a book in my hand. Can I be on the show? Or they want to give me a CD. Nobody calls me outside of wanting the platform. I relate to you, Bishop. I, I'm being, I'm being, no, I'm being I, I relate. I'm Don't the feel most... sorry for me. I'm all right. No, no. <laughs> I'm going to give out the, the suicide prevention line in a minute. Oh. Bishop, Bishop, I, they, everybody knows amongst the four of us, I'm the most distrustful. They all know that, and they say I'm the jerk of the group because I don't trust people. But I appreciate them for changing me because I am an introvert. And Jathan taught me you can't be introverted and be successful in your field. Kevin taught me that. You've got to be willing to open up. And so their relationship with me has pushed me beyond my introverted claim. And, you know, I champion that. Oh, I don't like being around people. But then God called me to preach to the nation. So I think sometimes you have to find people that will push you out of the element of your comfort zone. Sometimes, you know? before you say it, sometimes, though, and I, I want to say this for the benefit of those that might even be in the, in the audience, Sometimes we have to stop calling people arrogant because they're introverts. I, I think I needed to put that in there. Everybody's not arrogant because they stand offish. I'm not. I'm, I'm the nicest person in the world, really, except for today. YPJ might not say that. Um, <laughs> um, I'm not arrogant. You're not arrogant. But, well, so I can't speak for nobody else. But in, in most cases, people think that introvert or being you know the way you are is arrogance and we mistake that is everybody's not arrogant i was gonna say something i think too we're in a in the context this religious circles messed us up and we're so religious that we can't even see the principles that christ has set before us that when he wants to love you he loves you through a person so when i hear people say all i need is jesus i be like dad you're a liar you're hurt <laughs> You know, uh, because you need more than Jesus. He looked at Adam and was like, it's not good for you to be alone. So if all you needed was Jesus, he'd have never created Eve. Mm -hmm. So we need each other. But I think you might find just one person. It might not be a bunch of people. But I think if we don't practice getting whole, Bishop, then you'll be skeptic and you'll be paranoid looking at everybody. Everybody doesn't want your platform. No, I'm just going to keep it a stack with you. Everybody don't want your platform. They really want a relationship with you, but they might be intimidated because of your platform. Mm, that's, good. that's good. Might be why I can't find a wife neither. Um, uh, <laughs> Take a guy. Y'all too serious. We're taking no, we're not. No, we're not. I got daughters in the house Bishop that will. I, I want to ask the ladies. Is it harder for you all to find this kind of? Can I step over to find this kind of relationship amongst women? Shalandria Taylor, Houston, Texas. Absolutely. I think um, comparison is the killer of confidence. And a lot of women, we compare Say that again. ourselves. One more time. We got a little more time. Comparison is the killer of confidence. And so a lot of times when we want to be with one another, we want to share ourselves with one another, uh, it's almost like sharing your secrets means that they have a one up on you. And when they are ready to expose you to keep you from getting to the next platform, they will. 
that's what keeps me. Now, I'm an introvert to my core. I came in, I spoke, and I went back to my corner. Um, but I do understand that you need people in order to survive. But it's difficult, especially for women, again, because we compare ourselves so much to where we forget that who God has made us is enough. And because of that, it's difficult for women. Now, these women are great, so not them, praise God. <laughs> but there are, it, it becomes more difficult to develop real, genuine relationships with women because we're always in competition. It, I have heard women say that they would rather be friends with a, a male minister than, I'm going to say like this, a catty woman. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Nicole P. Lyles Belton, New Shallow Baptist Church, Atlantic City, New Jersey. Um, I think that the issue is when it becomes an issue of can I be myself around you without you thinking that I think I'm better than you. And then you can be around a man and he's not concerned about you know, how many Facebook followers you have or how many pair of shoes you have or what kind of car you drive or how many earned degrees you have. So I think that that's where the issue steps in. Can you, can you meet women who can meet you where you are and be comfortable with you being on your level, even if they're not there. I, I'm coming to you. I want to give the, oh, Maya White, St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, I want to give the flip to it because I don't have that issue. I'm, I don't have an issue with, I have a group of friends, we call ourselves the Fab Five because we are the Fab Five. But we, uh, we promote and we push each other. And I think that the way we could remedy this, women, is if we start being the woman that we are looking for. If you want someone to, um, you know, help promote and help be a good friend, or it, not even just about ministry, just be a good friend. You're looking for a friend, be the friend that you're looking for. Not every woman has a comparison issue or not every woman has um, yeah, an good. issue with another woman thriving. I believe that we all are going to win. And if I can help you win, then that's helping me win. That's good. That's good, Pastor Mark. Come on. Give us your analysis. I'll just simply say that our relationships are as healthy as we are. Mm. Our relationships are as healthy as we are. That's in all relationships, women with women, platonic friendship, men with men, the fathers, the sons. Listen to that voice. Your relationships are as healthy as you are as an individual. So if you see that you're having challenges with other people, oftentimes that's more about what's going on within you as opposed to what's going on with them. Drop the mic. Um, I, I wanna, we only have a few minutes. Um, I wanna pose this to you all. It is um, reported that since 2013, 55 pastors have committed suicide. I was talking, talking to Dr. Melvin Wade, uh, did an interview with him and it played the other week, great interview. And I asked him, I said, Dr. Wade, he just retired from great church in California, um, great young men succeeded. I said, why in your generation, we didn't hear about suicide? You didn't hear about preachers killing themselves. I mean, maybe they did, maybe we didn't have social media to find out quicker but I asked him, he said, I don't know. He said, because I've never even thought about giving up, let alone committing suicide. So can anybody help me? Uh, and, and I need to know, why do you all feel that this generation now feels like taking your life and ending it when you got hundreds, thousands of people? Not only do you affect the congregation, but you affect their families because you affect everybody. I Bishop, think, I want to say something. I don't think it's our generation. I think it's a, if you look at the demographic of the age of the preachers that are committing, them, committing suicide, it's not our generation. The truth of the matter is the generation before us looked a certain way were not emotionally healthy. They were good at what I, they I do, but they this. were not no, 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 good on, at who on, they hold are. On, hold on. The, the, these guys that are committing suicide are in their 30s and 40s. Y'all in your 30s and 40s. They're before. not all of them, Bishop. That's not the true. The majority of them. The majority. They're older. No. I think that people not having folks that they can download to, people that they can actually get the issues that's going on with their life, or someone who can say, hey, man, it's rough right now, but it'll be all right. I am very grateful to my friends when I'm having a down moment, 
that I can get encouragement. They're not talking about me. They're not laughing at me. They're not joking. They're building me up because they know that I got a kingdom assignment, and maybe at that moment their assignment is to encourage me to keep on going. So when you don't have friends that you can actually go to the movies with, uh, go stay at a very bad hotel where you're just trying to get some word from the Lord. We went to a hotel, and it was terrible. But this was in the beginning, but that was an experience that we learned from each other, and we had a great time, and it's become a great memory, and it taught us that we never wanted to be like that again. Um, when you have people that can, can deposit in your life something positive, something good, and, and push you forward, it helps you to get through those rough times. Reverend Clifford Clark, um, uh, also a mental health professional. Um, uh, I wanted to speak briefly to the the, uh, the epidemic of the suicide that's happening with, uh, yes, I do agree, our generation, 30s, 40s, and into the 50s, it's happening in that, that whole uh, demographic. And what I'm noticing is uh, it's, it's a lot of the skills that have been passed down from the former generation, which is the secrecy. You mentioned uh, earlier what were one of the disappointments that, that we were handed down, and I believe that was the secrecy of the elders, that they kept secrets. They kept, they didn't, they weren't transparent. And that's been passed down. And what's happening now is people are more isolative. The interpersonal communication skills are broken. So we're not connecting. And so when we isolate, just like uh, Paul talks about cutting the hand off from the body, then it dies. And we begin to introvert, we begin to self implode. And now the best option seems to be if I can't trust anybody else, I'm going to take my own life because that's the only escape. I can't escape the people. I just got delivered. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you I saw y'all. Did y'all want to? Yeah, I saw y'all. I got you. I, I just, just wanted give me to push a couple back. more minutes on this, please. I just want to push back on something just for a moment, Bishop, and, and really raise more of a question for you. Is it that in this generation there are more preachers committing suicide, or is it that there are more people committing suicide? I think that we, we minimize the... Um, seriousness of the issue if we reduce it to preachers if we look across uh, occupations and across all color lines more people are committing suicide uh, and so by virtue of that you see more people in every occupation but I think that that's a cultural conversation that needs to be had more than generational I think this speaks to the spirit of our age uh, suicide being a result oftentimes of feelings of helplessness uh, I have no effect I can't do anything else and all of that feeds back into social media and the competition and the I feel like a loser because I'm looking at, at Pastor Welton's church I'm looking at Pastor Nissan's church Pastor, Pastor Green's church now I'm feeling that I'm nobody because I'm hopeless I'm helpless so I don't think it's so much about generations as much as this is a a symptom of the age that we live yeah, in that's good uh, and so I, I don't think that it's just preachers I think this is people but we're dealing with preachers that's the reason why I gave that statistic that's true that's true but if we're going to effectively deal with it as preachers we got to understand that it's You're not saying just it's us the, I, I the got people you. that are sitting in our pews are dealing with it as well I got you so how do we handle that but, right okay so what I want to do and I'm gonna let uh, Pastor Green, I want them to put the number up um, because if you're watching right now, this is a serious thing. If you're watching right now, yeah. we wanna give you a resource. There is a suicide prevention hotline, lifeline. I, I don't wanna do this if we're not gonna help people. Suicide prevention, and I need some preachers to get our own number where we can do it ourselves. But it's on, the, it's on there right now, and I want you to just take your phone out and just take a picture of it. Those of you that are watching, take a picture of it right now. Suicide prevention, 1-800-273-TALK. The website is there. It is thoroughly private. And if you're watching right now, we can plead the blood all day long. It works. But we also need somebody to talk to before we do implode. Amen? Come on. And this is the last one. I also agree with what my brother, uh, Pastor Moore, said. This isn't a uh, preacher's issue as much as it is a... Um, a cultural issue, but for preachers that are in this category, I think I heard somebody mention it earlier. I think the lack of transparency yeah. is what is causing it. I discovered in the last several years that I've been in ministry, in the last four years that I've been pastoring, that sometimes ministry brought more misery than joy. Yeah. And had I had somebody uh, to kind of share a little bit more about it with me, maybe I would have handled some of my challenges different but I thank God for my father because one thing my father did teach me he he, he, he taught me <clears throat> excuse me he, he taught me that you have to fall in love with God because if you can fall in love with God 
he'll help you to serve beyond the challenges that come along with the assignment. I, 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 and, and I agree with that. I agree with all that. But uh, again, again, I know you all, you all are saying, and I think this is where a lot of people have issue with us, is that we say, yes, but it's happening everywhere. And we don't want to deal with it in our community. So that, that's my only thing. And, and, you know, that's just my opinion. Oh, my God. Woo! Y'all want to keep going on this? Okay. I want to add that um, every, I believe every pastor should have a therapist. I think that the way that we help promote um, emotional, spiritual healthiness in our churches and in our communities to change the culture is to tell people it's okay to have a therapist. It's okay to go see a counselor because not all you not all of us are going to feel comfortable enough to talk to a friend or another person um, that's in ministry per se. But if you have a licensed therapist that you go see, you know, either weekly or monthly, there is absolutely nothing wrong with going to see a therapist. And I think culturally we put a bad stigmatism on having a therapist. I'm going to take I'm going to take. Oh, Lord, y'all just pat, just pass it on back when you get through. One minute, y'all, seriously, because I want to be respectful to this panel, and I still got some roll-ins. Come on. Bishop, I think we ought to raise the issue tonight of that, um, you know, mental health matters. And uh, it doesn't matter if you're a preacher, teacher, or just someone in the pew. Uh, if there are mental health issues, I think one of the ways to answer uh, my, brother, my brother's question, I think we need to pull on the resources uh, we need to raise the awareness. We need to use our platform a little bit more, just like we do for giving and healing as it relates to laying hands on you. We also need to have discussions like this during perhaps our midweek services or on a Sunday. Change the way we do church because it's happening. Some of the pastors uh, that have committed suicide, some of them, when you go back and look at the history, they had suffered with uh, depression, mental health issues. And even though it starts with having this base and a friendship, and I have, you know, natural brothers that are just like you guys are, we're together, and then I have friends outside of that. But there are some things that you have to go outside of your circle to get. So I agree with you, Pastor, that we also need to not talk down on, you know, talking to someone, seeing a therapist, and pulling on the resources that are available in our city and in our community to help our people because the truth of the, and to help ourselves because the truth of the matter is I think that's the holistic picture of you know making sure that we prosper and be in health okay y'all gotta be obedient now 30 seconds now he took he took y'all shaving um, I was just gonna mention um, as a pastor who dealt with depression and suicide the thought of it I literally went to counseling a counseling facility no TV no cell phone um, to because I value my life at one point I did not, and I believe it's because our culture looks down upon it to where if you feel this pressure, you don't feel comfortable in going to a brother or sister without them thinking that you're less anointed if you go and get help. No, what makes me able to carry the glory is the, is, is the availability of my transparency and my honesty. And I think it comes from um, previous generations not just being open to talk about those battles or talk about those struggles, and we have dealt with the struggle in secrecy and then show the public success. Uh, Pastor Eric, Celebration Church, Detroit, Michigan. Um, as an educator who works day to day with children dealing with adolescent behavior, several times a week will I have children come to me often admitting that they want to kill themselves. For many of the same reasons that many of us have either thought about taking our own lives, it's because we want an escape from our issues. But however, because we are bound by churchianity, we were taught instead of going to see a counselor, praise your way out of it. But when I go home, my lights are still cut off and I don't know where the money's coming from. And I don't know how I'm going to put food on, my, on, on the table for my wife and for my children. And those are many of the things and the cliches that we have drowned our community in instead of actually advising them to really go seek, seek out help and, see, and talk to somebody. The same experiences that my children who are in kindergarten all the way up through eighth grade come and tell me almost, like I said, on a weekly basis several times throughout the week, they have some of the same issues that we're facing 
facing and we need to give them some real solutions because I can't tell little Jimmy in the second grade, Jimmy, if you give God a praise, your dad is going to stop beating your mom every day when you go home because that's all he sees. That's all he knows. And it makes him feel like they're doing it because of him. And he's the reason why they're going at it. Don't repeat yourself unless I tell y'all, okay? <laughs> yes, Bishop. I, I we really, got to close on this one, y'all, after this one. I really believe, and I'm going to be brief, that pastors nowadays in this season have so much pressure on them to produce, to perform, to be a celebrity on the weekends, to dress a certain way, to have a certain look, to have a certain following, to have an appeal, be a doctor, be a teacher, be an advisor. It's just so much pressure on so many people that many of them are breaking. The best thing I did in life is when I decided it was okay to be me. Okay, I'm a, that, no, that's when deliverance came in my life that I don't care if y'all talk about me and my jeans. I don't care. I don't, I don't care about I feel good. With, I am at the great place in my life that I feel good about me, and that's where it starts. Okay, come on, Pastor Rochelle. Come on. I'm so soft. Bishop, if there was one thing that I could add right now to staff, it would be a licensed psychologist or psychiatrist. And I think one of the things is we can't over-spiritualize schizophrenia. We can't try to cast that out. I mean, there are some things that we can pray for and, you know, fast for and things like that. But if folks are coming to us with general needs that are suicidal and needing the help from God, we can't be so prideful that we as pastors feel like we have what we need, what they need to actually counsel them, but to actually refer to them, the people that can actually help them. All right. I, I want to say this to that because... I went through that as a pastor. When someone comes to me and, and I can't help them, I try to send them to help. But the issue I ran into was I sent them to help that did not believe in the Christ I believe in. And so the flip side of that is we don't just need psychiatrists. We need psychiatrists who have a relationship with Christ because what they told him was part of your problem is your church. You need to leave your church. You need to leave your Christ. You need to go in another direction. So I'm going to say this to that. I do believe God is able. I'm going to say that. I do believe that God can still deliver the mind. But even in that, I think that we need Christian psychiatrists who can also help that. I just, I just wanted to echo that the heroic complex has been the biggest thing in the preacher dynamic that... I just wanted to echo some of what you've already said about wearing so many hats and having to be their counselor and be this. It's okay to say that's not my specialty. Okay. I, I, that's it, y'all. Give it up for this panel. The Justice League. You're watching Young Preachers. We got one more panel, and then we're going to hit Facebook Live. I need you to share. Everybody share this. Give us your questions and comments. We have two roll-ins. One my bishop, Bishop Paul Sylvester Morton, and Bishop Walter Thomas, and then we're going to have some music, and we'll be back. Roll them. Hello, I am Bishop Paul S. Morton. I'm just so excited to share this moment with you. Listen, Young Preacher 2019 Conference is going to be amazing. You've got to be a part of it. Listen, Young Preachers, I was young once. I promise you I was. And what is so important, when you, first of all, character is important, you gotta have that relationship with God, integrity is important, and then prepare yourself. Don't try to get over on people, but study to show yourself approved. When you have that kind of discipline, you win. Congratulations, young preachers, at the Young Preachers Conference. Greetings, young preacher. This is my opportunity to share just a nugget of wisdom with you that has helped me through these years of pastoring, and that is this. Always understand that people are different. That sounds commonplace, sounds ordinary, but sometimes we forget it. People are born and hardwired differently. Accept it, embrace it, learn to welcome it. Don't try to make everybody like you. Don't try to make everyone fit in the same categories everyone fit in the same ministry model. Understand that people are different. They will step to you different, come to you different. They will have different needs and different ways of understanding. If you can understand that and embrace the differentness that God puts all around you, you'll be able to effectively minister to each person. Remember, God is sending you to them to meet them where they are, in your church, in the neighborhood, wherever. Understand, people are hardwired differently, 
but God has made you that unique individual who can minister to them all. In that way, you become like Jesus. And in that way, the peace of Christ that passes all understanding guides you with what you do. Stay true to you and stay true to them. Take care. Bishop Paul Morton and Bishop Walter Thomas, give it up for them. Those of you that are watching, you're watching Young Preacher. It is the conversation of the ages. I want to thank you so much for tuning in. Those of you on Facebook, I need you to share. I'm going to look at your comments. I need you to conversate, and we're going to read the comments. Listen, he's coming back again. Bishop Brian Pierce, standing in his will. Give it up for him, y'all.
said, I promise you, Lord, I am saying your will, Jesus. That's where I want to be. You can have everything else. That's where I need to be. Right in the middle of his will. Save his place in the whole wide world. Hey, right in the middle of the will of God. You can have all of the fame. You can have all of the fortune. Give me Jesus. I need him, I need him, I need him. Oh. I am staying. Somebody worship him tonight. Somebody worship him. I know him. But somebody that's got a relationship with him. Wherever you are, lift your hands. Tell the Lord I'm staying. I'm staying. Say it in your will. 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 Brother Bishop Brian Pierce, I want you to follow him. Go download his music. Support him. Give it up one more time for him. Continue to share on Facebook. In about 30 minutes, we're going to switch over to Facebook Live. The conversation will continue behind the scenes another 30 minutes. I am. Have y'all enjoyed this? All right. Thank you all. Um, we're talking next to, to, to the next panel, and this panel is more about what's next. Um, I, I see a lot of tweets and um, various things on social media, Instagram saying, we got next, you know, folk are transitioning, we ready. We, so I want to find out what next mean. And I don't say that in a disrespectful way. Is the next, is the ne is the church in good hands with um, this next generation? Right now, I want to welcome Mark Moore, Jathan Austin, uh, Kalija, Kalida, Kalidra, Kalida, Kalida, I'm sorry, Kalida Forbes, I'm sorry, um, Nathaniel Green, Reginald Sharp, and Brian Meadows. Give it up for them. I'm so sorry. Um, what's, what's next? What, what's, what, what, what's the forecast? Um, you got a generation coming behind you, and I don't know if, if, if it's really realized you all the fathers and mothers in the faith. There are people that will come to you and ask you to father them because you, not just because of age, but because of what you've been through. I don't think age has anything to do with, exper with experiences that you go through. So I want to open that broad question up to the apostle. What's next? Well, uh, thank you, Bishop, for having this gathering. I think that is apropos for the season that we're in. Uh, it's needed. Uh, when you talk about what's next, I think that the name of this particular gathering is important. You called it young preacher, not novice preacher, not new preacher, but young preacher, because young does not necessarily equate to being a novice. And so uh, when we talk about what's next, I think that the church is in a time of significant transition. We're seeing fathers not just retire, but also uh, expire. And so pastors are looking for their successors. And so succession plans are not just being planned, but they're being enacted and initiated. And so I think that, that is, uh, that's what's next. Timothy has to be discovered, and then Timothy must be developed so that Timothy can be deployed. I think that that's where the church is at. Pastor Mark Moore, you, you, um, there's, there's a wave happening in, in your area. You're having a great conference. Uh, you've been on my show to talk about it. We celebrate you uh, for what God is doing. I mean, we could not have this and I say that to you. I've noticed that you have gathered young people from all the millennials, but you make sure that you keep in the room our generation, the Noel Jones, your dad. Set, stand side by side. I watched from my bed your your your, your conference. Amazing. But so, how have you kept that all together? Well, well Bishop, great question. I echo what my brother said, and thank you for for bringing us together. Uh, but I think that nothing illustrates this better uh, than the story that Jesus shows us through the feeding of the five thousand. We've preached that to young preachers. We've heard that story all of our life. But what stands out to me. If we can reduce it to this, it's simply that what the moment needed, the
the next generation had, all right? But it was useless until the next generation submitted what they had to those that had been here longer. And I think that where the church is now, we are a generation where we know how to do social media, we know how to brand, we know how to gather, we know how to develop, we know how to preach, we know how to do everything. But what's next is going to require the facilitation of both generations coming together. The young are strong, but the old men know the way. And so I think that what has to happen in order for next to become now is back to Malachi. There must be this turning of the hearts of the fathers to the sons, the sons to the fathers. And the next verse says, lest I smite the earth with the curse. Much of what we see, I believe, in church world and even in the natural world is a result of the curse that has been released because there has not been this turning of the hearts one to each other. So I think in order for us to have next, we can have zeal, we can have skill, but we still have to submit ourselves to wisdom because the pieces on the chessboard are moving, Bishop. You, you mentioned uh, the transition going on in Atlanta, and I think that the, the pieces are moving. You look at an apostle Ron Carpenter leaving, going to California, and a John Gray going to South Carolina, a pastor Jamal Bryant leaving Baltimore, a pastor Reginald Sharp going to take the reins at Fellowship. The pieces are being restructured. And because people are transitioning, the truth of the matter is five years from now, the kingdom generals will be completely different. Certainly 10 years from now, by retirement, by death of the grave, uh, it's going to happen. And so there must be this merging of generations to come together to do something great so that we don't destroy the potential that we built because we're too, uh, I don't know what you want to say, scared or, or unwilling to let go and to share what each generation has. How do you transition without disrespecting? How, how do you, thank you all. How do you, how do you transition without, I'm looking at, Several, of course, Dr. Dr. Arisha. I, I'm coming to her because I, I got a certain thing I want to go to. Uh, Pastor White, her, her father, you got them all. Dr. Nick, um, how do you treat without offending and disrespect? I went through it in Wilmington, Delaware. Um, you know, I was told I brought in the riffraff and everybody else in the church because folk was wearing jeans and all that. And I was degrading the altar and I, just all kind of stuff. How do you do that? And, and don't disrespect I I anybody. I don't think you can. Let me say that. Woo! I don't think you can. I think that any parent, when you're watching your child begin to mature, there's always gonna become a season where they start to quote unquote, my grandmother used to say, smell themselves, yeah. right? But as a parent, you know that they're gonna go through that adolescent or that, pu that pubescent period. They're gonna go through puberty. And so since you know they're gonna go through that, the frustration should be seen, the frustration should be calculated within the transition. So transition isn't gonna be easy, so we have to make ourselves vulnerable and available for the offense and for the frustration. I think that transition um, can be smooth. Um, whenever there's change, only, I mean, even babies don't like to be changed. They cry when you're changing them because everybody struggles with change. But we must understand those of us who are going through transitions, somebody like me following a Reverend Clay Evans, following a Reverend Charles Jenkins. Um, I cannot walk in the door acting as if nothing existed before I showed up. It, it, it would be immature and arrogant and, and ignorant to act like I, now that I'm here, now we can go into the future. You have to respect Moses so Joshua can thrive. You can't act like you've been leading all the way. There's a re, there was a 40-year period before you got to a certain place. And while you will cross the Jordan, you got to honor and, and give homage to the people who got over the Red Sea. And so I think, that, I think that that's what makes transition easier. Don't walk in the door, you know, and I'm not, I'm not going to walk in the door acting like this has to change and this has to change. No, leave it just like it is. And in time, you slowly move people to where you see God leading you to go. What do you do if the succession is not um, planned? Uh, you have to not only live yourself, but you got to take care of the pastor that's there because they don't have retirement, so you gotta, oh, I got a bunch of ooms in here. You, you, gotta, you gotta take care of their car note, their house note, their salary, and you looking at your own self. I'm trying not to get personal. Uh, what, what do you do? Can I, can I answer that quickly? Sure. Uh, okay. I believe that we have to lead understanding one day we may be in that place. 
So we ought to lead and show love and show honor and deference because one day we may be the preacher who, 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 who gets sick, who the church moves out, and you need one person to say, you know what, respect him, show deference to him, and it may happen for you because you did it for somebody else. Quickly. Having gone through that transition, I think you got to have a hard conversation nobody wants to have. And the hard conversation has to be, where's our budget? What's going to have to get cut? How do I do this by honoring you? But the truth of the matter is there's not room for both of us like this. It's a hard conversation. They lie. Go ahead. <laughs> exactly. But it's a conversation that if we don't have it, it creates more tension. It's a conversation that has to be had with the congregation. It's a conversation that continues to have to mold and develop over time because if we don't have it, we're hurting the church rather than helping it. And then what you're going to do is you're going to raise a young preacher that will end up becoming a bitter preacher because he's not being able to have the support needed to move forward. I, I want to I, I, I come to um, Pastor Green in just one minute because he said something to me last night. Um, all transitions are not in, in the house. There are some transitions that are in here that you're carrying the mantle of the person. You may not get their work, but you have their work in you. So I'm going there. Right, Pastor. No, he actually said it, so I'm just taking credit. Oh, that was good. <laughs> Uh, I just wanted to, to jump on that, just being a successor um, in the succession plan. I believe that you do have to have the conversation, but I will always honor my father as long as he is alive and when he's dead. But I believe that the job of the successor is to honor and take care of those that came before them. That's your blood father. Yes. And but still, no, I, no, but I'm, I, I know what you're saying. But there are others be like, child, that ain't my real daddy. I don't get no, I'm just that. <laughs> but I believe that the, but that, that's true. They do. But honor code is honor code. You honor what came before you and paved the I way. Agree. And I believe just like in Ezra, when they were when they were rebuilding the temple, they had they honored what was there. But they said, OK, we're going to work together. We got to have this conversation because there's a new dimension that we're going into. But you have to have the conversation. And we that are coming into next, we can't be arrogant to not honor what came before us. Reverend Ann Nice Davis, my grandfather said, he said, Sonny, just keep on living. You're going to get old. It's going to come back around. Um, I want to come to you, and then I want to do the two roll-ins because I want to get to the last roll-in for a reason. Uh, you shared with me last night, you didn't take over the church. You, you took over the spirit of, of your grand... Go ahead. Absolutely. I, 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 knew within, I, I knew with everything in me that I was going to succeed my grandfather. It was my dream to succeed my grandfather. I wanted to walk in his shoes, and my ambition for that clouded what my real assignment was going to be because I had no clue that God would move me halfway across the country to Dallas, Texas. But it wasn't until I moved that I, that <laughs> it wasn't until I moved that I, that I realized legacy isn't tied to a chair. Legacy is a, it's, it's tied to a commitment that you make to live out whatever God started in your father. He says in Acts 2 and 17, in the last days, I'll pour my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will see dreams. Your young men will see visions. And I think sometimes young men get it twisted. We think when we get a vision, God started talking when he gave us the vision. But really, every young man's dream is nothing more than a crystallized image of a father's dream. Every young man's vision, rather, is a crystallized image of a father's dream. And so we're nothing more than a continuation of a conversation that God started with another man, which is why it's important for the generations to walk alongside each other. Thank you, well, we can't throw fathers away, but you. fathers can't throw sons away. And this is why you have to make sure that the men or the women you're tying yourselves to, you don't need a sponsor, you need a father. Sponsors, they cultivate your ability on a platform. Fathers, they cultivate your character. They, they, they have the liberty to rebuke you and help. My father, Bishop J. Drew Shear, he doesn't just check on my gift. He calls and checks on my family. He calls to make sure I'm loving my wife. He calls to make sure I'm paying my own tithe if I'm going to tell my people to pay their tithe. That's what we need. We need fathers that will walk alongside us and make sure that whatever, whatever they were dreaming, we're seeing it correctly so that we can bring it into fruition. Amen. The two next roll-ins, the one and only, Bishop Ivy Hilliard, you, you know him, uh, and 
Bishop T.D. Jakes. Take him away. I'm often asked what wisdom would I give to young pastors, young leaders, and that wisdom is to learn to respect the mentoring relationships that God brings into your life. Now, it is the order of God to teach us and to train us by example. We are all the sum total of what others have poured into our lives that we chose to incorporate into our lives. So, we are all stewards of others' legacy. So value the connections and never let new mentoring relationships cause you to forget the investments others have made in you. Remember, God sends you into mentoring uh, relationships to educate you, to expose you, to exhort you, empower you, ultimately to elevate you. So be good, grateful stewards. Hello, young preacher. I'm happy to greet you and share this thought with you that I believe if you will hear it well, it will help to expedite your process and to better insulate you as you go up the road toward your purpose in the kingdom. I want you to understand that opportunities and opposition is not exclusive one from the other. Anytime you see the opportunity, you have to expect the opposition. One of the mistakes that many young preachers make in preparation for ministry is they prepare for the opportunity, but they are poorly prepared for the opposition. So they have not had media training. They don't understand the infrastructure, what they need around them for success. They see the stage, they see the opportunity, and they think it's all about preaching. It is not. You can preach yourself into a situation where you need more than preaching skills, you need leadership skills. Your ability to the lead determines how you handle opposition. So if you have a plan and a strategy for the opportunity, but it does not include a plan and a strategy for the opposition, you could get the opportunity and lose it because you couldn't handle the opposition. Come on y'all, give it up, Bishop Ivy Hilliard. Bishop Thomas Dexter Jake, I want to thank Melinda Henry. Thank you for getting those videos from me. And I appreciate all six of those men and women of God taking our time to do that. Thank God for the favor of God. Um, Bishop Jakes, opportunity and opposition, hand in hand. Woman of God, is that a, it, you, what, what, what say you about that? Um, I think that that was a very powerful uh, point of wisdom that Bishop Jake shared. And I think that we're seeing more and more in the last couple of years what happens when we're not prepared for the opposition. Um, when we're not prepared even to handle social media and the comments that people make one of the things I would like to do to charge or encourage uh, my peers is that we do a better job of leading on social media. I'm embarrassed sometimes about the way that we're conducting ourselves, um, the way we're choosing to respond to comments underneath our posts that we may not agree with and realizing that it's easy to be able to say, well, this is my twit and my tur. This is my face in my book. You can unfollow me if you want to. But that's not an appropriate posture to take as a spiritual leader to then turn around and lash back out at the person. You understand what I'm saying? But then we're hoping that they might one day come into our church and then be able to receive the gospel through us. And so I think that when it comes to opposition, especially because social media is such a huge part of what we do now in ministry, I want us just to be ever mindful of how we manage opposition, especially when it comes to our social media platforms. We need to be more mature um, more graceful um, and more sophisticated. Some of us need to put our phones down in Jesus' name um, so that you can take a minute because the reality is that we're human beings. And I think sometimes the pew and people don't realize that we're human beings. And so they're going in on us and we actually have, so you have hurt my feelings today, but then I have a responsibility to say that I'm gonna rise to a higher level and I'm not going 
to shrink down to where you are because I'm not just a preacher when I'm in the pulpit. I have a responsibility to represent Christ no matter where I am. And so I would encourage us all to just be mindful because a lot of the opposition I'm seeing happening on social media and we're destroying our credibility in one stroke of your thumbs. But don't go away from Facebook right now. I need you to share, all right? <laughs> 1,000 people have shared already. Now I'm trying for 1,500. Come on, I need you to share. Don't just enjoy the conversation. You need to share this with everybody. We want to break record. Um, right quick, because I want to shift right quick. We, got, we only got a few minutes, and I want to get to some other things. And something else, Bishop, I haven't really heard a lot of tonight. But I think what will help with that is if we really, really train preachers to go back to establishing a solid consecration. We, we don't talk about, we, we preach to the people about having a prayer life that we don't have. We, we, it's, it's to the point now, we want the people to receive the word. We want the parishioners to receive the word. But preachers don't even like to receive the word. And so we've got to really teach this coming generation, our generation and coming generations, to go back to getting on your face. And don't nobody want to talk about that. You know, go back, get it on your face and having a relationship with God. I meant what I said earlier. I believe in having therapists. I believe in having clinical help and assistance. But I also believe in the power of God. I believe in the power of the Holy Ghost. And I don't care what anybody says. I believe he can change your mind if you let him in. What, what about studying? Yeah. Yes. Bishop. Well, hold, hold on. What, what about studying? Because, you know, I, I, somebody hit me this week as I was preparing to say, you know, our generation, we studied. This generation don't want to study. Absolutely. Absolutely. They, I, I, I'm, I'm just saying that that's what the accusations are about the generation that, you know, oh, I'm not well, yeah, saying Some of them are robbing, uh, they're, they're robbing messages off of YouTube instead of going and praying and getting YouTube, one. YouTube but, Wait, absolutely. But, Bishop, can I add, I'm so glad you said that because you made a statement um, earlier tonight which struck me when you said there are some people that are like, I wish that I had more preaching engagements. And I remember years ago, we were at a conference at New Salmas in Baltimore, and uh, Dr. Uh, Billy Curtis, he said something in that young preacher session, and he said that there are many of us who are desiring all of these preaching opportunities, but he said that God knows you have no sermons. So that's why no one's calling you because they would call you and you wouldn't be able to deliver anything. And so as young preachers, right, we need to be in the face of God. We need to be in prayer. We need to be studying. When you study the word, the sermons are going to come as you're feeding yourself. You're going to begin to write and he's going to begin to speak. But a lot of times the reason why you're not getting any calls is because God knows. Right. He knows. And, and, and the, so you're not prepared. And the best thing that could happen for some of us right now was for nobody to call us. Absolutely. Because the, the, the fact of the matter is some of us have brands that we built and our anointing does not match our brand. The, your brand, your website, your logo can get you the invitation, but it's a good clip and get you invited. But will you be invited back? Will things be different when you leave? Right. And so I think that we need to embrace, and it goes back to the, the evolving conversation about right. exposure and competition. Wow. I got to get my calendar. So-and-so posted a flyer with their dates, and they got more than me. No, no, no. Embrace this time yeah. when nobody knows you because it's hard. It's easy to fail when don't nobody know you. Absolutely. When them lights come on, when, when, when people are following, the more people following, if you fall, more people see you because there are more people behind you. I, I tell people all the time, you want to come on the show on Greg Davis Live and all that, make sure you're ready because it only takes one time yes. for them not to call you. Yes. So the other thing, my, my grandfather used to say, he said, Sonny, just prepare the message. Prepare the message. God, I have somewhere for you to go. We're not preparing. We no. preach. We, we study to preach, not for our lives. That's it, Bishop. Bishop, one of the challenges that we're facing is we're promoting the issues of people that can't preach. So now we're following popularity. So it's no longer about preaching in depth. Now it's about how popular you are on social media. And so we're pushing and creating this culture and making it worse. Because when we're watching certain preachers preach, we all looking like, how in the world did they get this platform? And why are they shouting off of what this fool just said? So... So, 
Is it not true that you don't really have to be a great preacher to grow a church now? No. All you have to do is preach people that. issues, Bishop. All you have to do is preach the gospel of victimization. I, I, well, that's true. That's true. But if you go back, a lot of our fathers couldn't preach but had big churches. So I think that, that we have reduced. They had charisma is another word they had, though. They pastoring, had we have reduced to preaching. I think there are a lot of great, and I don't think we should fault them because they can't shout the house like somebody else can. That man, that woman is anointed to pastor people. Absolutely. And I think that part of our generation, we have so emphasized the preaching moment and the hoop and the E flat and the modulation that when the service is over, we're in the Batmobile and we're gone. We ain't shook nobody's hand. We ain't asked, how, how your mama doing? Your daddy still got gout. What's That's going it. on with this? Let me go to the hospital and see you. So I, I think that we have to, before we go further, we have to make sure that we're not making every great preacher a pastor. Because part of the problem with all these pastors that shouldn't be pastoring, as we talk about when they mess up, is we should have said it before we installed them and said, you're a great evangelist, but you don't need to lead people yet. That's good. So when That's you're good. talking about when you're talking about the preaching moment and, you know, everybody's talking. I talked to um, Pastor Harry Sheriff, uh, They want to be multicultural. But we were talking about intergenerational, multigenerational, multigenerational. And so I want to hit that. And offline on Facebook Live, we're going to talk about the social media piece, and we're going to talk about the church is actually right here in, in our hands. So that conversation is going to be continued. How do we deal with folks that's not coming to church? Statistics say 20% less come to church now. We're going to talk about that offline on Facebook Live. Um, so let's deal with that. The multi-generational yes, church. Multi -generational. We're living in a time right now where four to five generations show up at church. And we got so consumed with being reaching millennials that we forget the four to five generations in the room. And I consider myself as a bridger. And when my father turned over my church, his church to me, I was intentional about making sure that every generation in my church feels like new light is their church because I'm not going to miss a generation because I want every generation from the traditionalist to the generation X, Y, millennial baby boomer to say, that's my pastor and new light is my church. So from nonverbal to verbal communication, every worship experience, I'm trying to do something. So Sunday morning, the teenagers have Madden tournaments in the lobby, thanks to my youth pastor in their Our Life Lounge. I may wear a skirt just for my older generation to say, my pastor wore a skirt to church this Sunday morning. But I'm going after every generation and not just being social media savvy so that my millennials think I'm cool. We have to be bridgers because that's the strength of our church. You want to, you want to, I saw you shaking your head, Pastor Wendy. Did you want to share? You want to, can, go ahead quickly. Uh, I, I just second that. Um, I'm in a similar situation, and, and so with the older generation church, you don't want to isolate or alienate any generations. You want to make sure everybody feels included. Um, you know, the gospel was never meant to be cool. It was meant to make people conform so that we can see the power of God transform people's lives. And I really believe that we have to make sure that we don't get so trendy that we start to miss the power of God and the authentic anointing of God. Because we don't need to out-entertain the world. All we need to do is show forth the kingdom of God and the power of God, and, and they'll come. And so I, I want to say that Dr. Arisha was right. He has it right, right quick, and then we come to business. And so the question so I want to ask, you are, you Adele Kimbrough, Detroit, Michigan, how do you then bridge the gap? Because I know for myself personally, hymns didn't mean anything to me until I came into the fullness of who I really knew God is as a person. So how do you then bridge the gap between singing Israel Houghton and then hymns? I think you have to be intentional. You know, um, for me, my first year, thank God I finished my first year with great success, to, to God be the glory. But I was intentional to not go in and turn everything over and say, I'm the new pastor. It was about sustaining and stability. But you have to be intentional about reaching every generation. So when they want to do something and say, let's RSVP via text, I have to stop and say, no, y'all need a flyer because the older people want a flyer in their hand. And so you have to be intentional. Um, my young people came to me and said, Pastor, matter of fact, my son said, Mom, we want our own service on Sunday. And for years, I had a conviction about a youth service because I feel like that's a way that a young pa a youth pastor can turn your whole church around. 
But I heard him, and my father had prophesied that this would be the season where God would use new strategies to reach the masses. And I had listened to him, so now we're starting a youth services on Sunday. So you just have to be intentional about it. You all, we're going to switch to Facebook in just a minute. I'm going to let Bishop, 30 seconds, Bishop. Absolutely. So we're grace to pastor six living generations, so I echo exactly what you're saying, uh, Dr. Harish. I, I really believe that we have to be intentional, not just in the pulpit, but how we communicate if we have cancellations. Everything can't just be uh, through text because there's a generation that still want the phone tree. And so when, you are, when you're multi-generational, intergenerational, you got to look at all those different platforms. Ray, I need you to put that fly up. Those of you that are watching right now, come, uh, Jason. Those of you that are watching right now, come this way. Those of you that are watching right now, uh, I text every day to the young preachers right now. Just take a screenshot of it. It's young preacher at uh, text young preacher to 41411. Young preacher to 41411 right now. Young preacher to 41411. Uh, and you can get a daily text from me. I'm encouraging the young preacher. That's how I started this. Now I'm texting it out every day. Young preacher to 411. I have these young men up here because I want to thank publicly these two young men. A general is not good without some lieutenants and some sergeants. Thank you, Pastor YPJ. Thank you, Pastor Jason. We're going on Facebook, the Word Network. Let's go, y'all.